From the moment the first artificial satellites were rocketed into the orbit of Earth, the human conquest of space was perhaps inevitable. The path to becoming a true interstellar civilization was marked by great discoveries, terrible wars, and the fires of revolution. Yet as mankind enters the latter half of the 30th century, the dozens of star systems over which it now holds dominion speaks to the power and resolve of the United Empire of Earth. The Empire exerts control over roughly three dozen star systems and hundreds of planets, moons, and various other orbital bodies. Centuries of interstellar development have created worlds that rival the Earth in commercial, industrial, or scientific output, and a few have even nearly eclipsed the homeworld in terms of their cultural and historical significance. They are notable for their vast megacities, highly developed orbital infrastructure, and large corporate presence. While these worlds, together with Earth, represent the core of the Empire's power, the majority of settled territories remain underdeveloped. On these worlds, the strength of the Empire's institutions struggle with a lack of resources, losing their inherent benefits of employment and education and reduced to the dull instrument of a colonial power. Often, megacorporations will capitalize on this, moving in to monopolize the economy and industry of a fledgling world. As a federal republic, the political mechanisms of the United Empire of Earth are ostensibly democratic, but in reality, resemble a kind of educational oligarchy bordering on enlightened absolutism. Citizens from worlds that reach a certain level of influence are able to elect one of their number as their senator. This individual represents their world in the Senate, the organization responsible for the democratic process of government. Collectively, these representatives debate and determine the motions of government, headed by a high secretary who is tasked with maintaining order and reasonable progress within the organization. A senator will stand for a five-year term before facing re-election, with no term limit existing. The vast majority of worlds will only be afforded a single senator, though more influential planets may have two or three leading to a vast interconnected web of political alliances that exerts influence on every decision. The Senate itself is housed on Earth, which holds the most senators at five, creating a political power block centered around humanity's birth world. In the modern era, the Senate is divided between three dominant political parties, the largely traditional and conservative Centralist Party, the progressive Traditionalist Party, and the free market advocates of the Universalist Party. Acting as a counterweight to the democratic mechanisms of the Senate is the advocacy, the judiciary, and law enforcement branch of the government. Although the Senate may vote on imperial laws, the advocacy will define and enforce them. In the more turbulent years of the fascist Mesa era, it also served as a secret police force, involved in intelligence gathering, espionage, and assassination as well as propaganda campaigns and other more disturbing accusations that remain unproven. Today, it serves as a federal anti-crime agency, persecuting interplanetary lawbreakers and able to travel with impunity through every jurisdiction of the nation. As much ace pilots as they are skilled investigators, advocacy agents are feared by criminals across the empire. The organization is headed by a single high advocate, the counterpart to the Senate's High Secretary and ostensibly the most well-informed individual in the human race. The Empire itself is ruled by an Imperator, the Head of State and Commander-in-Chief. This individual is elected from amongst the members of the Senate, but, due to the nature of citizenship, it is possible for them to have roots in any branch of the government. The Imperator will serve for an extended, though term-limited reign. Since the days of the Mesa era, restrictions have been placed on the rule of the Imperator. They may still wield extensive political power, as well as influence over the advocacy and the military, but they will never again be able to approach the level of authoritarian domination that the Mesa dynasty practiced. While the federal government aims to bring the same level of state services to all its citizens, regardless of their socioeconomic status, its mixed record in this era has created a widening divide. 
This is epitomized in the disparity between the core and outer worlds, which manifests itself most strongly in the unequal access to education and citizenship. Whilst the child in the megacities of Terra 3 or Rater may be crowded into a classroom of several hundred, it is likely that a child of the colonies will have no classroom at all, instead being taught remotely through a mass-distributed e-learning program. Such programs are of little use to these frontier generations, and many will leave school before earning their equivalency. Though a lack of formal education does not officially preclude one from entering the workforce, it does drastically limit their opportunities. Equivalency is necessary for certain higher-paying jobs, holding public office, or entering any kind of government-related work. This has the effect of vastly skewing the ratio of commoners and citizens in the Empire's underdeveloped corners. Whilst commoner is a catch-all term for the majority of the inhabitants of the UEE, citizenship is a formal status attained through higher education or service in the military. Designed as an incentive to drive its populace to greater accomplishments, citizens are able to hold public office and take part in the democratic process, as well as enjoying certain taxation benefits and economic opportunities excluded to commoners. It is this division, more than race or religion, that defines society in the United Empire of Earth. The only reliable method of bridging the widening social strata of the Empire is a career in the military. While the armed forces technically requires equivalency in its enlistees, it has been known to waive those requirements if a cadet displays certain desirable traits. Those who are successful will rarely return to their homeworld after their tour of duty, instead using their newfound mobility to settle elsewhere in the Empire or become a career soldier. As one of the most prolific ways for a commoner to earn citizenship, the military holds an influential place within the public and political spheres of the UEE. A surefire, if dangerous, means for one of many downtrodden young adults of the Empire to better their lot in life, almost every citizen of the UEE will either have served or know someone who has. The Senate is rife with former soldiers who use their time in service to acquire the necessary knowledge to successfully conduct a senatorial campaign whilst some of the top agents of the advocacy learn the more overt skills of their trade within the ranks of the armed forces. Often the Imperator will have a service record themselves, their heroics in the cockpit of a starfighter or on the bridge of a battleship, forming a uniquely patriotic element of their campaign for ascendancy. As such, the High General of the Armed Forces often wields considerable political power, able to influence either branches of government or even the Imperator themselves, the military is divided into three services, the Navy, the Army, and the Marines. The UEE Navy is by far the most lauded element of the three, receiving the highest accolades, the most active press coverage, and the largest budget. The image of naval vessels patrolling the far-flung reaches of distant systems, hanging above densely populated core worlds, or clashing with the myriad dangers of space, is a sight recognizable to many across the Empire. The Army, in contrast, receives far less attention, relegated to the role of planetside operations and garrison duties on the strategic worlds of the Empire. A fully mobile and mechanized force able to conduct security missions and full-scale warfare under a myriad of conditions, the Army is nevertheless seen as a secondary combatant when compared with the service record of the Navy. Though the nature of war has changed drastically, both branches form an essential part in the security apparatus of the United Empire of Earth. Filling in the gaps of that apparatus are the UEE Marine Corps. Expected to serve as an expeditionary force, security detail, or long-range operations detachment with equal skill, the Marines rely on rigorous training and a wide use of technology rather than the overt specialization of the Navy or Army. Though widely praised and well-regarded, the military is not without its critics. Many still link its institutions with the atrocities of the Mesa era, where the armed forces spearheaded the rapid growth of the UEE at the cost of brutal crackdowns and acts of xenocide. To many, particularly in the colonies where the older generations see their children disappear into service, never to return, the military still represents the clenched fist of the oppressor and the enforcers of fascism. 
it was this expansion of military power, hand in hand with the development of practical terraforming, that birthed the United Empire of Earth from the former United Planets of Earth, itself a distant descendant of the old United Nations. While many modern institutions within the Empire can trace their history to both these preceding states, the first interstellar war fought against the militarist Teveran race between 2543 and 2546 exposed many of the nation's systematic weaknesses. The conflict also brought to the public eye the actions of Ivar Mesa. A hero of the conflict, Mesa utilized his celebrity to embark on a political career, elected first to the Senate and later named the High General of the Armed Forces. Mesa advocated a number of reforms, primarily the strengthening of executive power and the creation of a new office for their use. Mesa himself would assume that new role, elected as the first and only prime citizen. His reforms culminated in the declaration of the United Empire of Earth, and while the rapid changes this brought to society faced some internal opposition, they helped usher in an unprecedented age of expansion and colonization. A second triumphant war against the Teverin further cemented Mesa's power, who had adopted the new title of Imperator. This authority was transferred to his children upon his death, creating the first Mesa dynasty. The rule of the Imperators swayed the Empire towards an increasingly fascist state, and the threat of future wars against the neighboring Xi'an and Vandul species used to suppress dissent. In 2792, however, leaked footage of a state-sponsored massacre of human colonists led to widespread demonstrations and the overthrow of the Imperial government. In the years since, the federal government has instituted a series of counter-reforms aimed at reversing the autocratic acts of the Imperators and restoring the public trust. It initiated enormous public works, notably the Ark, a galactic repository of knowledge and interspecies meeting space, and the Synth World, an artificially constructed planet. It has even attempted to normalize relations with previously hostile species, although the results of these diplomatic efforts have been mixed. In 2951, the United Empire of Earth now stands at the precipice. Stretched militarily and economically, with the threats of the galaxy amassing and unrest fermenting in the largest megacities and smallest townships, the UEE has entered a time of uncertainty. Leilani Addison, the current Imperator, faces political attacks from the Senate, internal pressures from the advocacy, and the bleak forecasts of the armed forces, all whilst weathering the diplomatic pressures of the wider galaxy. With technological momentum grinding to a halt, it will take either an era-defining breakthrough or a titanic effort to reawaken the machine of human ingenuity. The Ark, though impressive, has fallen far off its mark as a place for all species of the galaxy to meet in Congress. The Synth World remains an empty dream, a hulking mass of sunken investment that will take the economic strength of an entire species to get moving again. As the promise of progress crumbles to dust, the threat of war looms. The Empire's military, so lauded and entrenched in its society and politics, draws ever more influence in the voices of the Senate. With such jingoism running high, the Empire could easily be plunged into a devastating conflict with another galactic power, all over some foolish thing in the borders. Whatever the galaxy may hold for the United Empire of Earth, one thing has become clear. The institutions of government, weighed down with politics and intrigue, have lost their impact. The tools of politicians are blunting, the grip of centralized power is waning in strength. The corporations, though prolific and powerful, are being muzzled by their dedication to the bottom line. The next age of humanity is coming, and it will be determined not by the efforts of its governments, nor the schemes of its corporations, but by the actions of its citizens. The Templin Institute investigates the nations, factions, and organizations of alternate worlds. If you've enjoyed this video and would like to join the Templin Institute, 
consider pledging to our Patreon page. Along with increased security access, you'll be able to vote in polls to determine future topics, get custom wallpaper every week, and receive some other exclusive rewards. Thank you.